Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I build a table unlike any table I've ever attempted before. I recently built a bunch of larger projects with some really nice wood, and as you can see, I couldn't bring myself to throw away the offcuts, I just wasn't sure what to do with it, and eventually I had a little bit of downtime between my next project and thought I would build something just for me, and really just for fun. I almost didn't even record this, but now I'm really glad I did. This first angle I'm cutting here, I just picked an essentially a random angle. It's about 10 degrees, but it doesn't really matter because the entire shape of this is gonna be dictated later on when I get to the power carving portion. And the only problem with these were they're actually too thick and normally it's hard to find that thicker stock, but it's gonna be a much, much smaller table. So removed the bulk of the material with the bandsaw, then went over to the planer and got them down to about an inch and a half or so thick each. Right now you might be thinking that I'm building a really crappy rocket for a science fair and hopefully it doesn't end up looking like that. That's not my goal. And so to get a little bit more movement here, I'm drawing just the start of a curve. And again, this is still a little bit arbitrary because most all of the look is gonna come from the power carving process. But right now I'm just kind of minimizing the amount of material that I'm gonna to have to remove. There's a weird phenomenon that comes with being on YouTube, being a woodworker, and using a domino, which is what that tool is there. And I've been as guilty of this as anybody in the past, but I am putting an end to it right now. And if you watch almost any YouTube video, as soon as they pull out the domino, they immediately start explaining themselves. And they'll say, yeah, the domino's a luxury. I, I saved up my money. It's not necessary. It's okay if you don't have a domino. And finally, I realized that Nobody really cares if you use a domino or not. And if somebody isn't gonna watch your video because you used a certain tool, probably not a very good video in the first place, or maybe they're not a very good viewer. Either way, I am calling for an end to the self-shaming of using a domino starting right now. I did not give a ton of forethought to this glue up, as you can tell, because now I cannot get it clamped down. And I only have about five or six minutes before this epoxy is too set up to do anything with. So I'm kind of frantically trying to find a way to clamp this down. And it was fun having Scott there because I didn't have to run around with epoxy all over my hands and move the camera, but he was getting a good couple of chuckles out of this. And you can see I got full desperation mode there. I was trying to cut a little notch to give the clamp something to grip onto it, but eventually I got it barely clamped on enough, I think. Good? No, looks bad, but <laughs> might be just barely clamped enough. Over the past couple years, I've slowly been improving my power carving skills, and I still remember my very first table, which I actually still have in my house, although it was a pretty terrible job, in my opinion, on the power carving, but I'd like to think that I'm getting a little bit better now, and this is actually gonna make a huge difference. This is something I wouldn't have done a few years ago, but it's gonna make a massive improvement to the overall finished look of this table. I basically cut those 45 to add a little bit more material in between the legs. So if I didn't have these in there, the legs would end up having to be really, really small or really, really skinny. And this is gonna enable me to really have more of a continuous flowing look between the legs. I get a lot of questions about what adhesive I'm using and why in different applications. And I do like using wood glue. I find it's a little bit more invisible, a little bit more seamless, but I like using epoxy anytime I'm worried there might be some micro gaps because you actually don't want to clamp epoxy too hard because what happens is you actually squeeze out all the adhesive and then lose your bond. And so anytime I think there could be any fine little gaps, I like to use epoxy, especially when you really aren't able to get as much clamping force as you would with say wood glue. I've got a few go-to power carving tools and I'll link everything that I use down in the description and none of this is sponsored, but one of my favorite changes over the last couple of years is switching to basically battery powered everything whenever possible. It's actually why I switched over to Milwaukee. I used to use DeWalt and I loved the DeWalt stuff that I had, but they just didn't make as many tools as Milwaukee. And this die grinder here, it works pretty well. It's actually tends to overheat if you really push it and it's an absolute hog when it comes to using up the battery but I love not having to drag a cord around the back of my shop because I don't have any power back here. So do yourself a favor. If you're thinking about buying a bunch of tools, look at how many they make because I really hate the fact that I had maybe six or seven DeWalt tools and a bunch of batteries and eventually just had to give them all up and basically gave them away to friends and family. 
but the Milwaukee is pretty good. I have also thought really hard about Festool, but I don't think Festool makes enough tools either. So for now, I think Milwaukee's in the lead there. This here is a spoke shave and does a really nice job at removing those high points because I don't care how good you are with an angle grinder, it's not gonna be perfectly smooth all the way down. And once I was feeling pretty good about that transition from the base to the top there, I was ready to start working on the underside. And I was never planning on leaving it flat, so if you thought that looked ridiculous, you were right. And now I'm really working on the shape and I never exactly know how these are gonna look when I start carving. I just kinda keep carving until hopefully it looks cool and sometimes it doesn't, but I think this one's looking pretty good so far. By the way, if you're wondering why do I have such a crappy treehouse in my backyard, you're a professional woodworker and that's what you have in your backyard. It's actually on my neighbor's property, but it's right on our property line and it's hidden by a bunch of trees so he can't see it from his house. So I get a look at his treehouse that probably wasn't very well built 40 years ago and is completely falling apart. And yes, I am hoping he watches this video and is shamed into actually doing something with it because a lot of you out there complain about HOAs and I used to do the same thing. But don't complain about an HOA until you don't have one and you have neighbors that leave toilets in their front yard and have tree houses that are falling down basically in your yard. For some reason out of all the scrap pieces of wood I had, I picked a piece of wood that had a giant beetle hole running through it, but that's okay, I think I know how to fix it. Drilled a quarter inch hole there and luckily didn't get any tear out thanks to that painter's tape. And this is a plug cutter, it's a quarter inch plug cutter. And it's a really cool little tool because what it does is it creates a nice tapered quarter inch plug that ranges from a couple hundreds under to a couple hundreds over. So just adding a little bit of wood glue and tapping it in until it's perfectly snug. The top that I'm gonna be putting on this table is actually not an epoxy tabletop for once, but I have built maybe a hundred or so epoxy tables over the years, and about 18 months ago or so, I finally created a course on how to build a wood and epoxy table. It takes you through every single step to have success, but I think almost more importantly, how to avoid failure, because that is where I learned all of my hard lessons. And I like to tell people that this course doesn't guarantee you success, but you get to skip the learning curve, because I'm still learning lessons myself, I'm even updating the course as I learn additional lessons on making wood and epoxy tables, but it's a really comprehensive course. It's like three and a half hours long, broken down into short, you know, five to eight minute chapters. If you'd like some more information on that virtual epoxy workshop, there's a link in the video description. The finish I'm using here is Rubio Monaco, but what's different about this piece is I sanded all the way up to 600 grit. And there's kind of a fallacy out there with hard wax oils like Rubio that you can't sand higher than 180 grit. And you definitely can. The Rubio will stick to it just fine. You just don't get a ton of water protection. And I do have an additional step that I'll show you here that will really bump the sheen up and give you the protection. You can see here we already have a really nice sheen on this walnut. This is sanded to 600 grit, one coat of Rubio, one coat of maintenance oil. And normally I would say this is good enough. However, I want a little bit more contrast. I want a little bit more sheen. So I'm gonna keep building those coats of N3 on it. And I feel like I've kind of misled people on how difficult N3 is to apply because it's really easy. On these curved surfaces, I'll show you just how simple it is to apply. And I think it's gonna look pretty nice on this because it already looks good and the N3 really bumps up that contrast and the protection. All right, so I have the entire piece covered really well. I can feel it start to thicken up a little bit. And normally with the table is where I let it set for about a minute and a half, maybe 60 seconds if it's warm out, and I'll kind of trowel off the excess. Since you can't really trowel on these uneven surfaces, I'm just gonna let it sit about that minute and a half, two minutes, I'm gonna give it a really light wipe down. You don't wanna remove all of the N3, so that's all you have to do. You don't have to worry about that troweling step. We're just gonna kind of wipe it down lightly, make sure we don't remove all of it, but also make sure we don't have any uneven shiny spots. Give it another quick look. I don't know how much it's showing up on camera, but I can definitely see the increase in sheen already. All right, wait about an hour, do one more coat. I have personally tested the durability of N3 over Rubio sanded up to 400 grit, whereas Rubio on its own, I never sand past 180 grit, and they don't even recommend sanding past 150 grit. But if you really want to bump that sheen up, bump the chatoyancy, just increase the overall look of it, it makes a huge difference if you keep sanding up to 320 or 400. 
I don't recommend sanding much past that. I do think that you're going to start getting a compromised finish when it comes to durability for things like tabletops. Legs like this, absolutely. I could have sanded this up to 4,000 if I wanted, but for a tabletop, I limit it to about 400. I did a quick glue up with some really highly figured wood that I had sitting around for the last couple of years. And if you look at that center section, it looks much lighter than the outer section and it is, but this actually all came from the same board. And I think I made a mistake though, because after this glue up, after the finishes on there, it looks like a little more contrast than I would have wanted. I thought this was all gonna blend together a little bit better, especially because it was from the same board. But let me know after the finish goes on what you think. I feel like a lot of us woodworkers, when we're choosing an edge profile, whatever we choose on top is the same thing we put on the bottom. But a couple of years ago, I just started wondering, what if I did something different? Would that look really weird or would it look really cool? And almost exclusively since then, I do different edge profiles on the top and on the bottom. And right there on the top, I did a nice clean quarter inch round over. But on the bottom, I'm gonna go a little bit more aggressive. This is a 60 degree bit and probably about as much as my router can handle, but I think it'll make it a little bit more interesting than just having a round over on top and a round over on bottom. People often ask me, they say, why don't you just use a shaper? These bits are way too big for a router table. And the answer is pretty simple. I don't have room for anything else. I finally maxed out how many tools I can wedge into my relatively small space. So I am looking for another shop. I'd love to have a bigger space. But for now, got to work with what I have. And for attaching this to the top, this is what I came up with. This is just a little jig I came up with for drilling straight holes. And this is going to be for one single threaded insert. I use a quarter 20 threaded insert. And a good little tip is to add a chamfer there. Chamfer, hey, hey, saying the chamfer versions with the British people mock me. And now they got me saying it. Anyway, added a thread insert there, added a thread insert there. And this will just allow me to spin that top right onto that base. Normally, I don't like staining wood, especially highly figured pieces of walnut, but I was so concerned about that center section being lighter than the outer section, so I'm using an English brown stain as the name of it, and this is an LED oil. This is similar to Rubio, only it cures under an LED UV light. It's a really cool one. I've actually switched from using Rubio altogether to using this vesting LED oil. It's a really cool one, and I do like that color. It's pretty good. If you have to stain something, I think this is a good stain to use. If you're curious, I ended up sanding that top up to 320 grit before adding the vesting LED hard wax oil. And now I'm gonna add two coats of the N3 hard coat and then another two coats of the N3 top coat and call it done. I got some hurtful comments on social media that told me that table base looks like a chicken foot and comments like that are just ignorant because chicken obviously have anseodactyl feet and this table base is clearly zygodactyl. I could see if you wanna say it was heterodactyl, but it is anything but anseodactyl. And actually I had no idea it was gonna look like a bird's foot. I don't hate it, but let me know what you think. Oh, there's that spot I fixed earlier. Not perfect, but about as good as I could do. And every week I like to give a little credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with just a project you'd like to see me try. As always, thank you so much. Have a great week.